Hey, before I kick off the podcast, I just want to shout out Nextdoor Clothing. Nextdoor, uh, a clothing brand based out of Bondi in Sydney. They're making really nice jeans and shirts and hats. So go and check out their full range at nextdoorsydney.com. They're also artists, so you can go and check out a range of art. They put on rad parties, and I love what they're doing. So nextdoorsydney.com for the full range. Dude, yeah. you love recycling tyres. I do. Why? Well, no one else <laughs> wants to use them, so <laughs> they're free. They do, um, for no. a little bit. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. No, we, they're, they're an awesome building material. Yeah. They really are. There yeah. you go. So you're so positive all yeah. the time. They don't break down. Dude, you don't break down. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's start. <laughs> Okay, this is for Clementine and Otis. All right, shout out as always to our sponsors, Indosol. God, dude, I love them. I love you, Kai. I love you, Kyle. You guys are the best. Anyway, listen, Indosol, you can get some slides or flip-flops made from repurposed motor vehicle tires. Indosol are a B Corp certified company that has taken over 100,000 motor vehicle tires that would have went to landfill or been burnt and they repurposed them and um, now you can wear them and look good and also do your part for the environment and, you know, become a conscious consumer. Like think about where you're getting your shit from, you know. So get a pair at indosol.com, that's I-N-D-O-S-O-L-E.com and use code THT at checkout for a 15% discount. Um, they have distributors all over the world so delivery is fast. All right, let's go. I'm having a good time. You are? Yeah. I can tell. And we are all in Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. Today's guest is Daniel Dayton. Daniel is a permaculture designer and lead educator at Elemental Permaculture, the business he co-founded with good friend Aaron Sorensen. Man, can you hear the excitement in my voice? Like, I'm so excited to have you, dude. Like, seriously, this is the pinnacle of the podcast. Anyway, let's keep going. Um, For many years, Daniel and Aaron have restored land, advocated for sustainable living practices, and created communities by developing and leading their profound permaculture design courses, one of which I did with them, and it changed my life. I mean that. Changing hearts and changing cultures, and they've also, like, just taught people from all walks of life how to make no dig vegetable gardens and they're just changing the world one no dig vegetable garden at a time in my opinion daniel is a significant mentor to me a kind influencer who courageously accepts his role as a custodian of the land we live on and the resources we draw from it today daniel is with me serendipitously to share his journey experiences challenges and hopes for the future daniel dayton Welcome. Thank you, Shannon. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> dude, dude, what are you doing here? How are you on this podcast? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> well, I've heard a couple and I love them. Thank you. And um, I really like the idea of getting a pair of those shoes. What do you mean? Yeah. You don't, I, I don't know if you're going to get a pair, man. You've got to prove yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, well, you, I'm here to prove myself for a pair of shoes. <laughs> dude, you, you don't have to prove shit, mate. You're the, you're the boss of permaculture, in my opinion. You're a guru. Listen, like... I'm going to put you on the spot straight up. Okay. Define the term permaculture. Permanent culture. Okay. Is that it? Boom. Done. Yeah. <laughs> no, it gets um, thrown around a lot. Mm, and I, I don't know if people mm, really understand what that term mm, means. Like what does permaculture mean to you? Well, if somebody come along and said, hey, Shannon and Dan, um, we've got a challenge for you guys. You need to – we need to um, – Plan and design a human uh, a, a, a suburb for for for, for a pretty particular area, and um, we would be considering all of the the human needs um, of people living in that suburb or that community, and and then also what in relationship to the land that it's on. Um, in a nutshell, really, it's about sustainable human settlement and what do we need to do to sustain ourselves as humans in relationship to one another and also the, the land that we're on. And so it's a lot more than just about growing food. 
Uh, a lot of people's entry into permaculture is growing food, about gardening and growing food, but it's everything. It's, ev- it, it's about um, all, all things that are human or uh, mean to be human, to be um, uh, humanity is, is what permaculture is about. Permanent culture, well, nothing's permanent, but we, um, we're striving for that hole in one, I guess, where the vision is that we could live for generations after generation after generation for thousands of years and what are the things that are going to help uh, a community of people to endure, to sustain their existence, um, to thrive in a place and do really well. Um, uh, coexist? To coexist, yeah. and with the, uh, with the environment? Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, to be able to, to, to do well as a... As a, a community of people, the environment has to obviously has to support that. Um, is fundamental to the people doing well that the environment's doing well. So, yeah, we're coexisting <laughs> with yeah. like low impact. Mm. I kind of feel like it should be called like low impact culture, mm. or something. Mm. You know, or minimal impact, or not even no impact. Yeah. Is yep. that is that too altruistic? Well, the the. Um, a balance, I guess. We're looking for balance and, and maybe um, there are initially some impacts in a society of, pe- of people moving to an area and, and settling in an area. Um, and then over time, the, that, that, that community of people would find a balance and, and that be able to coexist with all other things living in that area that, um, yeah... Mm. So, like, you've been obviously doing it for, would you say, a majority of your life? Well, I, I, I was lucky. I, I uh, ended up um, going to a course at university that uh, was really good for me, that doing landscape architecture. Uh, so I fell into this course that I, 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 uh, I loved and I really, um, yeah, it, it was a pathway for me from a young age. So... From yeah, my early twenties, I was I was I was um, involved in um, I, I was in a role or charged with a role where I had the opportunity to work with the environment, work with communities of people, and um, and I thrived in it. Or I I really yeah I came I, I found I found um, I found my place through that that kind of work, and I found a sense of place too of where I, where I was working and a real connection and belonging to to place. In the process of, um, yeah, doing environmental restoration work, like through that architecture course you did, yes. that's where you found that feeling. So, what drew you to that in the first place? Like, well, funny story. I, I at year ten, I went to do my work experience, and I thought oh, I'll go and do drafting. You know, architectural drafting. And were you good at drawing? Yeah, I liked. I loved tech drawing at school. Actually, so I, I asked that. I know you. I know you're good at drawing. I've seen your drawings. I'm trying to be like an interview guy. So I keep going. So you were good at drawing. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I don't know you how good it. I was, but I enjoyed Stop it. Stop it. I wanted to <laughs> pursue. Um, yeah, pursue that or give that a go, perhaps as a job and you know, year 10 at school and ended up at the local council, Shell Harbour Council in the planning department and um, where there was architectural draftsmen and I was around um, uh, town planners and met a great guy who had been to university and encouraged me to go and do town planning, forget the, the architectural drafting and, you know, aim higher I'd, I'd watch him week in, week out, dictating to his um, in his in his little recorder, uh, planning reports, and my eyes would glaze over think, just watching him, and I knew that wasn't for me. But one day, the landscape architects came to town and put up a beautiful, a magnificent, a beautiful set of drawings of the restoration of the foreshores of Lake Illawarra, and I was just struck by the 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 colour and the the patterning and the the lines and uh, and um, I didn't know whether it was a good design or not, but I, I really liked that idea of being able to illustrate or render the landscape in colour and and then go out and create it um, in real yeah, in in in, in uh, yeah go out and create it and and that was something I, I could see myself doing and so I was really fortunate just to have that one moment. Yeah, one one week of or so of my school 
um, work experience and to see that and I knew that's what I wanted to do and, and so I went for it and set my, set my goal to, to do well as, as I could to, to, to be able to get myself up to Sydney and go to uni. So you're attracted to the beauty of it originally. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the beauty of the design. The beauty in it. Um, the I, I guess I didn't reflecting on it now. I must have had an, an understanding that it also had the beauty of those drawings and what they were conveying was a, a landscape and and that what that uh, came along with all that too was that the there was going to be these improvements to the the physical environment in terms of. It's amenity for people, and then the biodiversity, and um, the the protection of the land, of having vegetation on the land, and being on the foreshores. I, I was aware of the Lake Illawarra at that time during the during the eighties was um, silting up, and uh, had had decades of runoff from urban catchments flowing into it, sewerage. And for those that don't know, can you actually describe what does silting silting off mean? So some, I mean, mm. yeah, I think it'd be handy for people to understand that term. Mm. Like, what does it mean when, when a lake is silting? Um, if you if you could picture then, say, a bit of ground that's had the vegetation removed from from it, it might even just be some lawn, and you strip the lawn off, and and then um, expose the dirt, and then it, the sun dries the ground out. Then we get rain, and it runs this the dried soil then washes off and down the drain and into the and sinks. To the bottom of the catchment, so lakes are the bottom of a big sink of a catchment, and um, and then over decades and decades, where those catchments have the vegetation removed, uh, the soil dries and then is exposed to erosion, like wit from the wind and rain. Um, year by year, that that soil on the land ends up um, washing down and infilling creek lines or. Um, uh, lakes, mm. uh, wetlands, mm. and it's a byproduct of overdevelopment. It's a natural development. It's a natural process. So, Lake Illawarra is, is sped up by development. Yeah, so it would have been yeah accelerated dramatically. The siltation of that particular coastal lake was had um, been accelerated by urbanisation of the of the catchment. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> no, it's good. It's yeah. good knowledge. Mm. Yeah, mm. because it it links back to so like so much. Like I wanted to sort of put you on the on the spot there with that because you know it leads into like how do you feel about modern development practices of land? Mm. And I, when I say that, I'm talking more in regards to the development of large residential areas now. Mm. Um, subdivisions, subdividing, mm. um, you know, where does that sit with you? I, I, when I was at university, we were, I was in the, fac, I was studying in the faculty of the built environment and we shared that building, that block with architects and planners, town planners, landscape architects, uh, and building surveyors. And we, we were, um, the vision was that, or the the learning was, the learning environment was that it was a collaborative approach to um, designing, and yeah, to, as design was a collaborative approach, multidisciplinary. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, my sad, this I have a sadness because that's not that never ha- well, seldom do, do have I been involved in that or see see that um, my peers or professionals working as landscape architects. Have had that opportunity to truly, really be uh, collaborating uh, with a team of of people, and not just the built environment, but community development workers um, uh, in particular. Yeah, and to 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 um, to formulate the a vision and a plan of action and and make it happen. So our our modern urban development is very much dr- developer driven. And um, and I'd, I'd imagine very much about maximising the return on the land that's available. Um, again, growing up in Shell Harbour, I had the opportunity to see the transformation or the um, the radical um, development of the the coastal plains of the where I was growing up, and um, 
and always lament that the, that was such a great a lost opportunity to um, to to de- to develop that area in a way that really would create um, um, one communities that um, the permaculture is trying in the, in the image of a permanent culture where. Um, well, I'm going to, like, challenge you a little bit, like, well, what's the alternative? Like, people need places to Mm. live, Mm. you know. Um, Urbanisation is almost inevitable with Mm. a growing population. Like, how would you like to see it done? Yeah. I'm totally for – I'm not – I've never – I've always found myself saying, look, we – development, I'm I'm for – um, the, the building of homes for people, that's a good thing to be doing and that we need to create um, places where young people can grow up in their places of origin and have the knowledge that there is a possibility that as they, as they uh, grow up they can create a home in, if they choose to live in that area. However, um, that's not happening. Most young people growing up in on coastal, the east coast of, or uh, yeah, uh, coastal um, New South Wales, for mm. example, don't have that opportunity. So I'm not I'm not against development, and um, it's the form that it's taking, and the form really is um, is not inclusive. It's not providing um, ho- opportunities for for all people to have a home, and so many people are excluded from the new suburbs that are being created or it comes at such a cost that it's a huge burden on a person's life um, financially and I and imagine would have many other impacts on their their person as well, as the impact on them as a person. Um, so you think more affordable housing? Yeah, smaller homes. Are you hinting at there's a gentr- the, the gentrification that keeps occurring? Is that what you're sort of hinting at? Um I think that I definitely think when smaller homes would be, um, I'd be advocating for small homes and a garden, you know, and what we're seeing is the opposite, massive buildings um, and no garden. <laughs> On <laughs> so, tiny blocks. Yeah, tiny blocks and for That's very weird. small families. So it just it doesn't make much sense and I, um, I know myself that I don't, I know that um, I don't like cleaning the house, <laughs> but no, I, I don't believe a it. lot. <laughs> you know, it's not high on my list, <laughs> but I would find it incredibly um, Me either. challenging. Same, to, dude. To, I don't have time to. Yeah, I, I do. I'm I'm, I'm okay, but uh, to clean a huge building would be yeah. I couldn't yeah, no, do it. Yeah, I, I, mean, I hate it. <laughs> I feel bad yeah. saying that. I do it. Mm. I do it sometimes. Sometimes. I'm going to get someone to do my washing. That's another thing. Let's not talk about yeah, that. Yeah. No, but like you're right. Oh God, yeah, it's weird when you think about it like that. These huge houses on these tiny blocks mm. and there's often maybe like three to four people living in a place mm. that could probably house, I mean, let's face it, in some areas of the world, 10 to 15 people. Mm. It's strange. Yeah. So that's on, that's one aspect. The other is just in terms of the building design and so inefficient not, well, how could they be? How could they be uh, utilized more effectively? Most homes, uh, um, so a well-designed home would be um, would be cooled naturally and warmed naturally. So it would be passively heated and cooled. Um, it would be very low in its energy consumption. The resources that are used to build that home would um, would would be uh, would would have a smaller footprint um, and. And the running costs of the buildings would be very low as well. So we're not seeing that. We're seeing homes that are that are that are they're using incredible um, incredible quant volume quantities of natural resources um, for very little gain in terms of. Well, there's a great cost that comes along with it. Once those those resources have been assembled into a building, they then go on and consume a hell of incredible amounts of energy um, over their lifetime because they're so inefficient in terms of their design. So they're not even, yeah, that's the frustrating part. They're, they're costing a lot, of, a lot of money for people and, they're, and yeah. They're, so uh, are you saying like by the design, the placement, the direction they're facing, things like that, and utilising the, the, the sun better and um, catching, catching water off the roof, is that what you're sort of saying like? Yeah, it would be those things and um, like, like designing them in a way that actually 
adapts to the environment that they're being built in, mm. you know. Is that what you're sort of saying? Yeah, very um, – from – the, the basics, the, from basic orientation of the building yeah. towards, the, towards the sun, um, the winter sun, allowing winter light into the home to warm the, um, uh, the, the, the walls and floors of the building so that they can warm up during the day and slowly radiate heat out during the evening to keep the, the building passively warm. And then opposite, um, in, in summer, having large eaves to block the, the sun that's higher in the sky so that in winter the sun angle's quite low so that can come into the building. Um, midday in summer the sun's r- almost right overhead. So simple design of um, the widths of the, the, the overhang of the eaves to, to block that sun can make from coming. T- yeah. Mm. Uh, allowing the the building to uh, – windows on the buildings that allow the breeze to flow through the building. So many windows have such a small opening that they can't possibly, you know, scoop up – scoop the sea breeze in um, during summer. And so houses aren't even being naturally cooled by the prevailing winds. And then, yeah, blocking off the hot afternoon sun in summer, for example, you know. How many of the big, uh, these uh, big, how many buildings have huge walls facing the, the, the west and southwest afternoon sun and are cooking, you know, through, through the heat of summer. And, it's energy yeah. lost. Yeah. And, I mean, just before, um, just, just recently this um, last few weeks has been some great stories about the urban heat island effect that's hap- that is that's created where we have um, hard surfaces, concrete, bitumen, uh, tile and metal roofs covering um, the large areas of land surface. So western western suburbs of Sydney, for example, already where um, the western suburbs of Sydney are experiencing 45 degree days. They're forecasting that to go to 50 degrees. They're, we hit they hit 48.5 degrees Celsius in western suburbs of Sydney, once it goes over, once we start hitting 50 degree days, um, urban planners are saying that it's just uninhabitable. There's, there will be areas that will you cannot live because the air temperatures are 50 degrees, ground temperatures are going to be even hot, higher again and the suburbs, the homes that have been built in the past and now are just um, will be uninhabitable. The, the 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 energy demand required to run air conditioning will not be there. Um, power outages will will render many homes, thousands of homes, in that kind of urban heat island effect uninhabitable in in very short period of time. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I haven't heard that. Yeah. Yeah. You look it up. Uh, the urban heat island effect. It's where we be- because of clusters that. Because of these clusters of houses that are so close mm. together, are, are generating more heat. They ha- the the built the buildings, the the driveways, the roads, lack of um, vegetation cover. So one of the yep. strategies is to rapidly re re vegetate the western suburbs of of um, of Sydney. Sydney to to actually shade the earth from the sun to keep the ground cooler. Oh, my one bee in my bonnet, and I'm on a mission. If it, and I want to turn car parks into parks, you know, yeah. like they're called car parks. Yeah, but but can you make a car park a park? park. You know, and you so, still park your car. Yeah, there. still park your car, but it, so what on dirt? No, no, just bring the trees back. You know, the shade yeah. trees. So so many of the car parks attached to retail outlets have zero tree cover because. They're designed so you, you so the passerbyers can see the building, see the billboards, see the so, so people go in. But as a consequence, there's in addition to the these huge warehouse buildings with massive roof covers that are exposed again to full direct light. The car parks, black bitumen car parks, are cooking in the midday sun. We've all radiating, ra- re-radiating that heat out, reflected light, radiant heat, and just on days where we have incredibly high um, ambient air temperatures, you know, we all have, would have had, a, had an experience where you're looking for a shady tree in a car park in summer and you just won't, there's so many car parks that don't have them. And I won't name the businesses that I'm, I'm, I want to target. But name them. Fuck well, it. I think Bunnings has, you know, has, they lollipop all of their, they lollipop their trees. 
Yeah, I'm, Do they? I'm I've gonna, noticed. I'm, I'm going to... What gonna, do you mean? Like the ones they sell? No. Or they, the ones in the car park? In the car park. So there'll be... Why a, do they do that? Well, there'll be a development. Probably there would be a requirement by the local uh, authority, the council, to... The, the, as part of the development approval, they would have to have... Um, they'd have to have trees... X number of trees per car parking and, spaces. And no and, low branches. So they're on the plan they're they're putting trees in the in the landscape plans for the development approval, but once the trees are planted, um, they then manage those trees as they're 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 coppiced or they're they're pruned to two to three meters high. They're never allowed to um, they're never allowed to grow to a full canopy tree and do their job to shade out the the um the, all of that hard surface and to reduce the the the, the heat the heat, effect, the heat the, island well, I mean, effect. Well, I mean, it's like a, the big frying pans. Yeah. That's what they mm. are. Like mm. we're developing these big frying pans yes. on our landscape. Mm. So we, it's all pl- – I guess we're at a point now where there's so much of the landscape is covered in hard surfaces that we, we, we're in a situation now that with um, increasing temperatures during our summer months – is creating these climate extremes in like, in microclimate Why extremes. Why is that microclimate? Okay. Yeah, but across suburbs, and um, and so we we're at a point where where we're being um, the warning now is that we if we don't start to reduce this heat island effect with with strategies to reduce the heating up of the hard surfaces of our landscape of, of the urban scape, they 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 are they're already. Um, Incredibly uncomfortable places to be on a scorching summer day. No. Um, but they, they, the warning is that once we start seeing 50 degrees days, they will be uninhabitable. <laughs> which, is, yeah. which is ironic, isn't it? Mm. It's like, yeah, we, we've, we've developed this whole area for people to live and then we've mm. to the point where now we can't live there. Like, mm. Mm. Yeah. But what comes to mind for me is like places like LA, for example, in America, like that's what, that's way more developed than than Sydney. Mm. I mean, do you think they're having that problem? I mean, they've got other pro- they've got a lot of problems with yeah. that. But do you think that's happening? Like it must be. There's no uh, I can't imagine there would be they would be um immune to it mm. if they they would be having hot summers. Um they I, I know they've they've been through yeah, c- catastrophic fire events um in their in their last year, you know, through their summer and so that's a trend in on the west coast of of America. So, of course, yeah, any any climate that has extreme summer temperatures has uh, removed, reduced the vegetation, forest vegetation cover dramatically. I mean, we you, we could say that maybe only less than ten percent of the suburbs, some suburbs, have tree cover. I think Wollongong Council, for example, recently, oh, New South Wales government re- released. A percentage tree cover um, for all of the suburbs of um, of New South Wales a few years ago. And okay. I think Port Kembla, when I was, I'd, I'd moved out of there at the time, but it was something like seventeen percent. Um, that's pretty low. <laughs> You know, very low tree tree cover for a suburb. Um, you could go to. How say, do they come up with that percentage? Oh, just aerial mapping, uh, just aerial photography, and looking at the percentage of canopy tree cover. Um, per square meter of suburb, and so some suburbs would be very, very low. I know, um, yeah, parts of Shell Harbour, the uh, where I grew up um, in in. Well, just to, just for people who don't know, like you, you mentioned Shell Harbour. I mean, can you describe that area? I mean, it's, I mean, it's it's highly developed residential urban area, correct? For, yeah, if we went from the coastal edge and. Um, 10 k's in uh that that's that coastal plain is highly urbanized yeah landscape yeah and increasingly so now because of the lack of um with a spillover from sydney so wollongong and shell harbour have become a um, satellite suburbs of sydney now so many people are commuting from the, the that region the illawarra to to sydney which is synonymous with all around the world that's what happens yeah. right mm. So urban planners are considering the necessity of canopy trees, correct? Yes. But yeah. Again, I want to just go back to like how are they deciding how many canopy trees are needed mm. for a development? Do you know? Mm. Like where are they plucking these numbers from? Like 
I'm confused. Like, well, the studies that have, are mapping are looking at just what's there and just describing the data, you know, just giving the data that we're seeing very low levels of canopy cover in many suburbs and some areas very high canopy cover. So we could look at um, parts of the northern northern suburbs of Sydney, from Sydney Harbour Bridge right through to Hornsby. Quite a quite a treed um, suburban landscape. Um, very high, high. Mm. I don't know what the percentage is, but it would be um, considerably higher than su- than um, suburb that's got ten percent or fifteen percent canopy yeah. cover. Yeah. Mm. Um, or if we're going western districts, western suburbs of Sydney, for example. So the 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 feedback. One of the principles in permaculture, um, principle four, um, is uh, apply um, self regulate Oh, accept, accept feedback and, and apply self regulation. Self regulation. So, thank you, teacher. The, <laughs> well done, like, I was actually stressed. Yeah. I was like, I was scared you're going to put me on the oh. spot and go, Shannon, <laughs> what's, what's number four? Yeah, yeah no, nah, yeah, mm. apply self regulation. Yeah, and that's what I love about permaculture. It's principle based. And, um, well, okay. Mm. Can we, again, like, can we go into that a little bit, the principles and ethics of permaculture? Mm. Again, for, for people that may not be aware of it, because when I first heard them, I was just like, this makes so much sense mm. because, and it is, it's, you know, I went into it with the mindset of like, oh, I want to learn how to grow food, but it's really a program for living. Mm. Would you describe it like that? And I feel that you can just, you can apply these principles to all aspects of your life, like even relationships, you know, <laughs> like especially yeah. relationships yeah. actually, yeah. like with professionally or intimately or whatever. Mm. So can you tell us, like, what are the ethics of permaculture? There are three ethics, uh, earth care, people care and a fair share. Uh, fair share is a shortened version of the, the full description. Um, uh, I, 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 I can't remember the, the verbatim but it's the um, equitable distribution of resources um, or the, the distribution of resources equitably across all, um, for all. So a fair share, fair access and equitable access to resources, um, whether yep. that's for humans or, you know, other other life as well that depend on those resources. So, yeah. Amazing. So it's really, it's really based in equity, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And then what the 12 principles, like I won't make yeah. you rattle, yeah. rattle them all off, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Well, it's well. I don't know. Like we could break it down. Could could you yeah. like could you break down <laughs> fundamentally? Yeah. How do how do you see the yeah. the principles like applicable to to a sustainable life? Uh, well, it's it's a planning tool. It can be viewed as a planning tool. The to principles. guide your decision making. Yes, to, to okay. guide decision making. Yes, and, um, so, and so give us one example then. Well, it starts with. Well, give us one example yeah. of a, a principle. Yeah, well, let's say um, for in the context of a planning tool. Yeah. Yeah, so well, the first four are perfect in okay. that sense, yeah. But if we're starting with one, it's like look around, observe and interact. interact. Yeah, so before you, before we do anything, um, yeah, ch- check the lay of the land, whether it's the for the garden that we're going to build or the neighbourhood that we're walking into or... Um, the new culture that we're in place that we're going to be observant and interact and yeah be there and be and be be aware of where you are and what you're doing and and who's around you and and um yeah so really get present with that place and so then we can apply that to ourselves too about observing and interacting with ourselves and how we are in relation to other people or our relationship, our children, our partners, our community and how, how, we, how I'm showing up, you know, or not showing up um, uh, on, a, on a day and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a really a cool um, entry, uh, a cool starting point for planning and design but it's a great um, touchstone for that um, um, applying some uh, uh, principles to our our life, yeah. Um, to to put it in the garden yeah. gardening context, what I'll, I immediately liked about it is that you are observing and interacting with the the weather patterns and the natural environment. So if you were to build a garden in the space, you know, mm. the immediate thing that you taught me to, or taught us to do was like, 
okay, well, so where does the, where's the sun rising from? Mm. Uh, and where's it setting in this space? Mm. Okay, what else is present in the space? What what trees are already pre existing, and how can how can we um, you know um, build around them and with them to to utilize the protection of some of our more delicate crops, mm. for example. Mm. And um, I was just like, well, yeah, and oh, what direction is the predominant winds, mm. okay? Like let's have a look at the wind patterns over the course of a year in this area, okay? So where are the predominant winds in winter and where are the predominant winds in summer? And, and, that, and then that dictated where we planted certain vegetables and trees and it's just like, <sighs> And then it's funny because then you, you, you interact with the weather like that and then those things that you plant uh, seem to thrive quicker. Would that be correct? Mm. Because they're happy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, 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 they're harmoniously in the space as opposed to barging into the space, correct? Yeah. It's, um, plants have evolved, been evolving on, on the earth for millions of years and, and we only have to, we can look at different plant communities to see how different species of plants have adapted to their environment and do really well. They'll thrive um, in one environment and then a different species will thrive really well in a different environment. And so food plants are the same. They're, they've been, they're cultivated ecology. Their agriculture has been around for 12,000 years or something. And so people have been working with wild forms of lettuce and turning them into plants that are a form of a hybrid that we can make a salad out of. And so, and they've, over thousands of years, those those lettuce have seeds which have got a, adaptations to sun and and um, and really good soil. And so you put them in the shade and with not much sun and and don't give them and and poor soils, they're going to struggle. Whereas, yeah, so you're that, weakening the species. Well, with yeah, they, they'll still be strong and they'll try hard. You know, they'll try their best, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they're gonna. It's gonna be tough for them to thrive in in a in a, a mm. microclimate uh, that's not suited to their needs as a to 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 go through their life cycle to go from seed to plant to flower and seed and do it all over again next year and and then the next year and next year. So if we want to keep um, growing lettuce, we got to keep cultivating them and growing them and saving some seed and and growing them again next year because um, yeah, that's that's what they rely on for. For, for their um, ongoing evolution, I guess. They have a relation. We, veg, a lot of vegetables really depend on people to, to, to grow them because they, they need us to do the work for them, you know, to get the soil ready and water them and all that. So, yeah, they're kind of, we're working for them. <laughs> do, do, you, do you believe that building quality soil can save the planet? Yeah, yeah. Without like, sounding too, uh, oh, you know. Like, is it the mm. fountain? Is soil building the foundation of environmentalism? It, it always or ta- conservationism. I don't know. Um, I, there's a cool word that um, I always remember from. I always always share when I'm teaching about soils, and it's called concomitant. 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 And new, new word. Yeah. So I looked it up, and um, concomitant. Con, so it, that con plants are concomitant. With soil and soil is concomitant with plants. So, what you can't have plants without soil, and you can't have soil without plants. So, yes, soil is fundamental to life on Earth. Um, soil is the the digestive system of the of the Earth in that it's recycling. Um, well, it's definitely the digestive system of plants. So. If we don't have soil, then it's very hard to establish plants on the earth. And which we eat. Which we eat and also which, we breathe from and yeah. provide all sorts of resources for us, So whether it's fibres or building materials. So yeah, soil is fundamental to life on earth, um, both for, uh, from on many, um, on many fronts, yeah. So nutrient-dense soil equals nutrient-dense food? Yeah, yeah, that's a cool thing. Um, that's so awesome, like... I've become so fired up around that aspect of growing food, and um, that if by having a garden we can we can like really take charge of um, the our health in a way of our health in that our gardens become can be these superfood um, gardens that 
provide produce truly nourishing food. Uh, an, an example would be where you, if we went and ate hydroponically grown lettuce and other vegetables for our whole lives, uh, we're going to be we we will have different we'll be we'll be nourished very differently to what we would be if we were eating food from a garden that's uh, from soil that's been um, that has been um, grown on um to to it's from soil that's that, that we have um yeah so the from soil that we have um that we've that we've been building yeah that's the word that we've been building soil building practices that include the returning of organic decomposed organic matter in the form of compost the remineralizing of the soil for example things like calcium that we need in food to make us strong and to for all other elements to be working to be replenishing trace elements that get washed out of the soil by rain and heat and and plants when we you know when we when we're taking food from the garden we're mining those minerals from the soil so good mm. gardening's about building soil returning minerals and organic matter and in the process by doing that we're building a living soil that is doing all of the magic as well in terms of firing up enzymes and hormone activity and um, the, which is byproducts of microbial life, bacteria, fungi, worms, and all that. So it's this living machine, and um, cyclic. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's a cycling. Um, yeah, it is. It's a life cycle. It's a whole living entity. It's not just dirt. It's um, it's a super organism, just like mm-hmm. us. You know, we're made up of you know myriad of different species of bacteria and other living. Entities, you know, like not just I'm not just Dan here. I've, there's a whole bunch of different species that make me function, make me that I'm made up of. And so soil is the same. It's a super organism, multi-species living entity that um, that we need to take care of and nurture and and to to um, improve. And so much of our um, much of the main product of our work as gardeners is soil. That's the legacy that we leave is this soil so that uh, our, our gardens, when we pass on or move on or move, move away or whatever, um, we're leaving this soil that will then be there for the next generation of gardeners or people living on that garden, in that community garden, in that agricultural landscape. So, yeah, it's this thing we were talking about before that, <laughs> That that um, custodianship or that r- the, the the relay and carrying the baton and yeah. Do you think it can be achieved on a large scale though in the in in industrial farming? Mm, definitely. What, yeah. well, okay, why isn't that happening? I think. Um, I mean, we've we got um, we went agriculture really has gone down and been going down a track for so long that it's hard to to for us to to come back from that. At this point, there where, and we're at a point where soil, as a consequence, the track that we've gone down is the um, is is an input based one, a chemical input based agriculture, and um, and mechan- mechanized, so using machinery to to prepare the land, and then providing plant food in the form of chemicals, and then sustaining plant life with um, uh, pesticides or insecticides and. Biocide. So that that's been going on for so long that the soil's collapsed, the soil health has collapsed, um, and and then there's more of a need for pesticides yeah, to so, grow adequately. Yes. Yeah, so um, a, a concept, another concept to to um, to share is that that is that pests come along as cleaners. Um, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that. I was trying to yeah. prompt you towards yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah, they're coming in to clean up um, an old crop. Or a sick plant, and so if we've so if our soils aren't healthy, then plants are already struggling. Yes, they're growing, but they're not. Their immune systems down, and their their health is compromised because the soil health is compromised, and they become susceptible. Yeah, more vulnerable to to getting disease, and so <laughs> that can then lead to pest infestations. God. Coming to clean it up and unpack it all and return it into the earth for us. But hello, humans. Yeah. <laughs> You yeah. know, like, like humans, mm. we're the same. We become susceptible when our immune yeah. system's down. Yes, and yeah. I'm going to go on a rant here. Yeah. Why we're in a we're in a pandemic? Apparently, well, no, we're in a pandemic. There's a disease, a gnarly disease out there. 
why are we not getting messages on a large scale to increase our personal health as opposed mm. to just grasping for face masks, sanitizer. Mm. These are the messages we're constantly given to protect mm. ourselves. Why aren't we being told? Why isn't the masses of population mm. being told more often? Lose weight, stop smoking, eat a, a well-balanced, healthy diet. Why not? It's not happening enough. Mm. And then, yeah, then we are susceptible to virus and yeah. pests. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's Plants uh, are the same. It's a basic principle of life yeah yeah, so i say that i say this nearly on every podcast so (laughs) like i just had to say it again it's like well if no one else is going to say it i'll say it like (laughs) yeah we we're following we 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 see the same patterns play out in our health as we see playing out in plant health and animal health yeah and it all comes back to the soil and so william albrecht of um one of the um like the the professors of soil and agriculture who was around between 1850 and 1950, he talked about spam. Soil, also S-P-A-M, spam, and we... Like the meat. Like the meat, the canned meat, you know. <laughs> and so he, he referred, he used that acronym um, really well. Uh, he's a great writer and a great um, speaker and um, produced a huge body of work and spam was his little banner for um, what does it stand for soil health plant health animal health man health that was back in the, the day but human yeah. health so yeah. if the soil's healthy the plants we have to start with the soil health plant health will be good animal health eating off the land will be good and human health will be so now it can be like yeah. a spa 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 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, right. yeah, spa, yeah, spa, yeah. Is there an SPAH? Yeah, spa, spa. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Mm. Mm. Makes sense, right? Mm. Yeah. I want to go back a little bit to before you. Um, so you went to you went to university and and you, you found you found something you were interested in. Mm. When did you start to gravitate towards a desire to? To restoration projects, mm. okay, because you've done some like amazing restoration projects. Like, let's face it. I mean, I've seen the work you've done, and can you maybe just tell us what what drew you to that and where you got started with mm. it? I, when I was at uni, one of the students, he was Stan. He was a mature age student. He's probably forty at the time, and he was walking around with the design Bill Mollison's permaculture designers manual. And I got chance to to see it while I see it, you know to to read some of that, and it it uh, struck me this ethical ethical ethically based design system that Bill Mollison was um, uh, yeah had, had his manifesto, and so f- for me that that was a a, a real um, awakening that if I'm going to do sorry keep going if I'm going to be um, um, working as a landscape architect, uh, I, I'm gonna. I want to have that. I want to be coming from that place, that ethical foundation, and and making decisions that reflect that. As a designer, I had the opportunity um, uh, while I was at university. I took a year off and worked at in Wollongong at Wollongong Council, and and started working on this wetland restoration project, Tom Thumb Lagoon Wetland. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Can you tell us yeah. about that and why, like what happened there? Like, Well, there was, I had a really awesome manager, Jim Mitchell. He was just a real visionary guy and uh, I pestered them for a job. Look, just, you know, wrote a letter. I'm, you know, I'd like to, I need some work experience. Could you, is it possibility for three months work experience during my break you know between my third and fourth year and I got uh, yeah sorry no work so I wrote after the fifth letter um they gave me a job and um, the three month position went to a year it just so happened that there's this project um there was a couple of projects that were happening that year that they needed a person to work on and they were shoestring budgets but a big vision and and um and the timing was right so there was a little. There was a seven hectare or so remnant of salt marsh wetlands that uh, 
that was left over after all of the, the five, they say 250 to 500 hectares of salt marsh, tidal estuary, sand wow. flats, the Tom Thumb Lagoon um, ecosystem had been progressively dredged and filled in through the BHP steelworks um, complex. And what was left was had a sewerage rising main running through it, a, a, an industrial landfill site on one side, freight cores. Um, industrial landfill site? Yeah. So Was well, that just gnarly? Well, it was because what's coming out of that tip now is... is um, and ha- what has what's been coming out of it and still leaching out of that tip is is um, diabolical, really, because back in the day when that that landfill started, there was it was straight into the wetlands. There were no liners put down, so the tipping started uh, into the salt marsh and the mud flats. <sighs> this highly um, in, a pervious environment where water's moving all the time and. And at the time during a post-war period, so probably the fifties when it started, it was receiving industrial waste, domestic waste, hospital waste, <sighs> um, night soil waste. You name it, it was all going in there, unprocessed, just straight in, yeah, and building waste. So it would go in, and then they just would just keep filling and cap it with. I, I was I was lucky to grow up at a time where you could go in and with your old with my old man and go to the tip and we'd unload the trailer and you're allowed to just free range over the tip and harvest whatever you like, you know, pulling out old bikes and whatever. So those were the days where any, anything goes, you know, and everything went in. There was, and because there was no liner, all of that um, pretressable waste, all of the metals, all of the – so anything that rots, um, like organic matter – that is acidic and then you have you throw chemicals into the mix like paints and uh, oh. spent oil petrochemicals and then you put industrial i mean hospital wastes in and 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 everything went in and all of that becomes a toxic cocktail like they were just dumping it like into the lagoon yeah the first layer and then there wasn't an... and, and that's tidal so that yes. that rises and falls with the tide yes so that that toxic Whatever it is, cocktail. is going yeah. cocktail is mm. the best. Is going into the ocean as well. Yeah, so it's all migrating as groundwater the through the mudflats and into Port Kembla Harbour, and also that would be moving through the sand dunes into the into <sighs> the ocean. So it's just. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, hi- in hindsight, it's a beautiful thing. Mm. I mean, they wouldn't have really considered the environmental impact at the time. Do you think? What do you think they didn't care? I don't. I I still think people were intelligent and aware back then, and they chose not to. They consider the consequences of. They chose not to be forward thinking. So, for sure, they they had the brain capacity and the intelligence to be able to explain. Oh, well, yeah, Dan. You know, like if you do this, um, from a chemistry perspective, these are going to blah blah blah. They, they could probably. Re- they would have been able to tell us what some of the um, compounds that would be coming out of a mix of all of those types of um, wastes. So they would have known, but again, it's that, f- that, f- that forward vision and, um, and, and not, not holding that um, in a place of importance to, to guide their um, decisions back then. So in hindsight, for sure, we can look back and say, we'll never do that again. But even back then, I don't think there's any excuse. People would have known. Environmental health people, engineers, scientists, um, ecologists. Well, was it the 50s and 60s? Mm, See, it wasn't, yeah. well, let's face it, it wasn't that long ago. No, yeah. Post-Second World War, I imagine that would have, but mm. it may be even earlier, maybe even earlier, pre-Second World War, but it, it had been, the steelworks came to town in... in um, I don't know that, yeah. Yeah, early 1900s. So sometime in the early 1900s that tip started and probably, yeah, 40s or 50s it got, you know, it's really started to ramp up its um, waste production from urban communities would have been increasingly increasing in the post-war period, urban expansion happening, um, the growth of Wollongong as a regional centre, the industrialisation of that um, area. So, yeah, the, the volumes of waste were increasing and so a site, the, the, the Coniston Builders Tip, which it was called, um, was, yeah, uh, probably um, established in response to that for sure and then 
and then became the major centre for landfilling uh, right up until we when we were... So what year was that? Well, I started in 91 and um, it was still an active tip. So it was still tipping in 91 and continued to be tipping until probably 2010. Uh, sorry, um, until around 2000. Yeah, so another <sighs> 10 years. So yeah. you were... Can you give us some examples of like how did you start the restoration project? Like what were you doing? Were you going in and cleaning waste out? No. Were you were you planting? Were you, what were you doing? Well, the cool thing was that um, it, uh, the Jim Mitchell um, connection was a visionary go- uh, man running the landscape design division, and um, he he saw a partnership approach to re- restoring this quite large landscape, and also to um, in working with the stakeholders and people who had had past impacts on there and engaging with them to 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 and building relationships with them to um, to work together for the restoration so rather than council being the taking full responsibility for it we he wanted to engage the coal terminal the steelworks the Sydney water um, urban residents um, council as well as um, yeah, the grain terminal, all those industrial land users, urban um, residents and council office and, and council as an organisation to come together. So my job was to coordinate that, to make connections, build relationships with key people in each of those organisations. And we didn't have a budget to do any works, but at the time Sydney Water was restoring the rising sewerage main. So we, they had a machine in there. The first, so the first thing, the first opportunity was to work, collaborate with the guy who was on the excavator, and obviously get permission from the um, Sydney Water for, mm-hmm. for to for that that operator to to work with us to start doing um, clearing of environmental weeds, for example. That was the oh. first thing, and then once we cleared, had started clearing environmental weeds like uh, that that had which had. Um, colonised the whole of the site. So we're talking about Bidu bush back yeah. in the in in the nineties. That was a major environmental weed. So clearing all of that out just so that we could then start with excavators. You're just scraping it off, yeah. stockpiling it, and then and then and then um, preparing. Not a, yeah, just clearing it so that we could get in and start revegetation works with the community. And then at the same time, then engaging with other industries to see how they could contribute to to um, an overall restoration plan. At the same time, we we were developing the a restoration plan too, so we weren't just was it, was make, it regarded as a an environmental disaster zone? Like, was it deemed a disaster zone? Not at all. It was it was more just um, swept under the carpet. So <sighs> nobody was testing at the time. Nobody really wanted to be testing at the. No one really wanted or was testing at the time. So really, it was a forgotten area and a quite a important or quite a significant area of public open space right at the edge of Southern Wollongong and a buffer between the suburbs of Southern Wollongong and the steelworks. And um, if for people who haven't may not have been there um, when the southerlies blowing. Um, all of the coal term, the dust from the coal terminal, the emissions from the steel, uh, um, the furnaces at the steelworks, all of the houses, you know, your houses would be covered in black soot and, and grime and, and particulates that had been precipitated out from the air blowing off the steelworks when the southerly is blowing. Like acid rain. Yeah, and lots of particles, so heavy metals yeah. and um, coming out of the... Like um, soot. And yeah, coming the, out of the yeah. stacks and... And and whatever else, yeah. So, the so the wet early. the wetland and the tip represented quite a significant area of land that could be a, a potential buffer to the to the southern suburbs of Wollongong from um, airborne pollution. So, um, yeah, it was it was an area that has totally neglected. And Jim Mitchell saw the potential for there, and saw the and saw the. They had the understanding that a that a collaborative approach and a partnership approach was the way forward, and building relationships with people who, in the past, had been the, the drivers of impact. And so, 
we but yeah we we needed to work together and and in the process we all learned together a hell of a lot about the value of these wetlands and the benefits of restoring what was left even though it was um much very diminished from its original extent and um and yeah so thir- 20 or well, 21 now 30 years on there's a thriving um ecosystem there a terrestrial ecosystem around the the wetlands so all of the land above the wetlands so the salt marsh has been protected mangrove plantings have been established and um huge colonies of a uh, huge community of mangroves have, have been established and upland vegetation um, fo- forests have been created on the tip and on landfill areas around the wetlands how, how accountable was bhp did they do they contribute or take any responsibility for it? No, there was I, no one would, I, no industry or organisation was coming out with that kind of language publicly, or definitely not from the CEO, CEOs. They wouldn't have even known we, what we were doing, well, you know. Were they, were they providing any funding? Not really, no. I mean, there was not a lot of funding, so. Um, but what 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 I've found is that within every organisation, there are local people, people who live in the communities, people who work in those those uh, companies, who who um, yeah want to do good and have the opportunity to do good. So they would channel resources and funds if they were available towards the project, and there were lots of creative ways to attract funding to it as well. So. And, um, yeah, so definitely we could have – it warranted big sums of money being um, dedicated to the restoration of that project from the likes of BHP given the impact that that industrial complex had on the the, nat- the physical environment, the natural environment and the cultural landscape there. Like, yeah, it, it, warrant, it would warrant millions and millions and millions of dollars um, – but yeah, that that kind of money wasn't forthcoming to to the the project, so it very much came from a model of community development, community engagement, working collaboratively with people within organisations to make the change happen from bottom up. Yeah, man. So when it comes to, I don't know. I, I would, okay, here's my question for you: How do you feel about being described as an activist? <laughs> I'm not sure that I am described as an activist. What do you mean? Uh, like, yeah. Oh, okay. What if, what if I was to describe you as an activist? Yeah. Activist. Yeah, I'm active. How do you um, feel about that? Too? <laughs> yeah. I, oh, oh, yeah. I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, the, I'd kind of probably associate it with more direct action type of militant behavior um, uh, campaigns. But what I do is more. More um, day to day, year to year. Um, <laughs> well, it's a lifestyle. Isn't it's it? a lifestyle. Yeah. So, um, I think activist activism is um, that we, there, there's maybe a, a sense that there's there's those flashpoints where there's activism, mm. and but I think it's also true for activism is 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 also um, displayed and. It's it's day to day too, so I'm a day to day activist. Yeah, I work. It, yeah, I bring it into the day to day kind of world. Yeah, yeah, like mm. like you're just living it. Mm. You're not like you're not really trying to arouse controversy. But when we talk about big multinational corporations like BHP, mm. who have polluted the lands for many many years mm. indiscriminately, mm. does it arouse anger in you? Um, I, I never, I never got like fired up angry in relation to that wetland project. Um, there was frustrations for, for sure that we weren't getting enough support for, and the, and the work that we, was, that we were doing is really needed. It was, just, it was, it was really, um, there was a principle, yeah, it's the principle, I guess, that. Um, that an organisation should take respon- or an individual organisation take responsibility for its actions, and those action, the actions of that industry had clearly 
uh, clearly um, created harm to the environment and caused long-term damage to the natural ecology of the air and, um, yeah, wiped away, wiped off the face of the earth, whole landscapes that no longer existed. Mm. So, yeah, there was a... There was a the deep down, there's an anger there, but my response has always, I've always, def, not def, well defaulted, or my 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 response has been to what 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 can we do? What can be done? Yeah, what can we do with the situation that we're in? And um, how can we be yeah, proactive? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there's maybe there's um, there's. Um, Occasion, like examples, there's there's been there's been incidents within within the the projects where it's really I really have got angry and upset and fired up and gone to the media, definitely you know, and I've wanted to raise awareness about something that's happening that's just not acceptable and needed to be addressed, and someone needed to be held accountable for spills um, and overflows of pollutants and. Which was a common occurrence, and um, and 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 then what we found happening was that we, after the anger came, then a strategy and an action and a plan, or plan and an action, and and working with someone within um, an organisation to try and develop a solution that would be more long lasting, rather than just putting a spill kit down to 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 um, yeah to, to to stop the 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 um. Yeah, the, the point source of pollution, for example. So cultural change, mm. yeah, within the institution or the organisation and working with people in my community or in the, uh, yeah, and the, from that bottom up um, and hoping that that would, um, yeah, kind of move up through the organisation or through the culture. And I think it ha- there's aspects that um, years later, you know, we years later, the Living Classroom Project came about because of our the work that I'd been doing at Tom Thumb for for near, over a decade was a direct led was a direct found or the um, a direct connection to all of that that led to the Living Classroom Project, um, uh, yeah, well, happening. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe you can maybe explain that to us a little bit. Um, do, do you think maybe? That is your form of activism, but through education, and then and you've 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 endeavoured through your work mm. through with uh, elemental permaculture as well with Aaron Sorensen, mm. who's also just prolific in what he does. And I mean, you guys are such an amazing team, mm. and you both bring such unique qualities to it. And you're you're almost like a yin and a yang. Yeah, very different. Yeah, <laughs> like he's this big man with big dreadlocks and a big voice and a big heart, and mm. and um, maybe. Different in stature, you and maybe soft spoken, but powerful in in another way. You guys work; you do work well together. Mm. You guys are amazing. Yeah. So you know, how did how did you you and Aaron embark on in you know just developing uh, the delivery of permaculture design courses? How did that come about? I, it, over a number of years, yeah, we um, we we'd already been working together. And now we came together through the Living Classroom Project. That's how I first started collaborating with Aaron um, professionally. And prior to that, we'd both been on our own, um, working in our own communities um, it, as community gardeners as well as doing my doing the restoration work. So we had a shared interest in community gardening. And I think we both understood the role of community gardening as a community development model. So it was... It was about people and um, one thing that I was really drawn to um, through working at Tom Thumb and became more aware of the need of was the engaging with people. There's no way I could do all of this work on my own. It was too big a project and yeah. and that was never the... Um, the never, never, never a strategy. Really, it was always we have to collaborate and network and and bring people uh, together to find solutions. And community gardening really is um, a great example of cultural development and changing culture, creating cultural change. And so, uh, my wor- working with Aaron, we had that common understanding and common passion and in- passion and interest in the cultivated landscape, working on public land um, 
the that fair share ethic of not so so many people living in public housing or an apartment and or don't have a you know their own garden so this public open space is like reclaiming that um public open space for the people for us you know it's public open space so yeah um but, but do you think people just don't understand that i think that they didn't have permission people didn't don't feel felt they didn't have permission to go and Use that land, even though it's public open space, to grow food. Yeah, yeah, but because I'm aware of a project you did many years ago in the suburb of Wollongong, Port Kembla, Mm. in the alleyway there. Yeah, the laneway. The laneway. Mm. I mean, that. I mean, that still thrives. Yeah, I was walking down there the other day, and um, the trees are just. Yeah, I was was calculating the years now, and some of the trees that we planted would be. They're not that old, but they're they're like they they um, started in ninety four, <laughs> twenty. Yeah, it's like two thousand and twenty one. So nearly they're nearly thirty years old. Some of the trees. And yeah. I mean, do you look at those trees and go, "I remember when you were a seedling." Yeah, all of them, all of them, definitely. That's a trip, yeah. dude. How's yeah. that feel? Wonderful. Oh, it feels. It made me, makes me feel good to go down there, and mm. I feel compelled to go down there when I'm back in town and to have a walk and. And, yeah, just be around the trees that were planted and, and remember um, that time and the people who were involved. And, and being a laneway, it's a public, public uh, pedestrian corridor, so I'm all, there's always someone walking up and down there and I never know if I'll meet someone or not um, when I go and visit, but inevitably I'll bump into someone and get into a conversation and... In the, with the backdrop of all these beautiful trees and in the context of having met that person through planting trees or not necessarily with them but they were part of the, the time, that time and place and in the community mm. and, and enabled the tree planting the community gardens to happen by, by not pulling them down or not ripping them out, not complaining, just being a supporter, um, not even on the sidelines but just being a supporter and saying, yeah, we... We, 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 um, yeah, I, I'm because there were a lot of people didn't, but that those there were plenty, most of the people, most people, and not, not everyone even got involved, but just having that, the, um, support of people by looking out for it and just caring for it or, or yeah. liking it, yeah, appreciating it was, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't walk through it and go, hey, this is cool, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember some days when me and Lance, so Lance Abbott is my. Brother in arms, there we he, we connected very quickly early on when I first moved to Port, and he um, and I teamed up. And without him, that laneway would never have um, wouldn't be what it is today. The project he, we 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 were the two that drove it, and and out of our efforts, so many other community, uh, so many other, a, a few, quite a, a couple of other really key cool things happened for me uh, through that laneway project. Um, yeah. What, what would you say to someone who had a desire to start a community garden mm. themselves? There's, there's I'd, I'd just say start doing it. And um, as Aaron always has, has said many times, you know, say? like it's just better to ask for, forgi- for, for forgiveness rather than permission <laughs> when, it's better, when it comes to community gardens or, or gardening on the planet. <laughs> well, I think it's a great way to deal with bureaucracy. Yeah. Ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Just do because <laughs> if you are, if I ask for permission, the you they'll you the answer will most likely be no. Well, that's when you hit red tape, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'd get out there and just start growing a little few square meter a square meter of of garden. Start with that, and someone will come along. Few herbs. Yeah, and either say, "Hey, what are you doing? That looks cool. Can I help you?" Yeah, of course. Yeah, no. Yeah, well, let's do a bit more, eh? and then when yeah. uh, someone will come along and complain, and then. Council will come along and have a look at what you're doing, and and come council. Someone from council will come and check out what's going on, and that's when you get into it. That's when you you have the you use the permit the forgiveness card, but you get the other card out too, which is the conversation card. <laughs> and um, because you try to ring that person, you won't get through to them. You know, yeah. you won't even know who they are, and they so, don't give a shit. But they yeah. don't want to say yes mm. because. They're scared that they might become accountable in some way. Mm. That's what's so fucked about it. Mm. It's like that person on the phone, they don't really care. Like it's not – but they're like, oh, well, I don't want to say yes. Mm. I'll pass that to someone else mm. because if I say yes and there's a problem with it, oh, I don't mm. want that on me. Mm. 
Yeah, it's uh, just extra. It's just another thing that, on top of many other things yeah. that that person might be required to yeah. do in their jo- yeah. in their job description. Yeah, and in fact, it probably sits outside of it. it on. Yeah, and so it's a problem. I don't want to be liable. Mm. Next yeah. thing you know, you've got worldwide lockdowns. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could all it could lead to that. Yeah, <laughs> so that's why I wouldn't ask for permission. You just go start gardening because if you did ask for permission, are you could... <laughs> telling me people have complained about residents have complained about you growing a garden? Oh, we our what? Well, the, what? Why? Uh, well, Bob lives on that lane way. Bob, who? Um, one of the one of the residents that lives on the laneway. I don't know his surname, uh, but I've known him ever since. Is this a metaphor? Yeah. No, this no, is okay. a fella. Yeah, he's yeah, a, okay. Yeah, he's a okay, guy. Sorry. Yeah, so Bob. Please tell us a story. <laughs> Once upon a time, was a name, yeah, guy named yeah, Bob. Yeah, well, there was there is a guy named Bob that lives on that lane, and he's he has always complained about the laneway. Why? And because he doesn't what? like the leaves getting didn't he, he, he really. Um, He's frustrated by trees. He's frustrated by trees. Uh, they're a problem. They've, be, they've, in his worldview, they're a problem because they drop leaves. They get in his gutter. He has to sweep them up. It's for him. It's a big deal. It, it is. A, it's a problem for him. Like it's become a problem for him. Trees are close by to his home. So that us being there was a problem and was exacerbating it and uh so this became a big problem didn't it it hasn't because we we didn't when we started that project we knocked on everyone's door up and down that laneway and asked let them know what we uh, what we were, would like wanting to do mm. what they thought about it were if they would like to, Trees or gardens established adjacent to their homes. Some people loved the idea, some people didn't. So wherever people didn't want that, we didn't do anything. But there's there were already some existing trees in the laneway and Bob, um, yeah, was suffering. Is that those. his real name or did yeah. you make that name up? <laughs> just to protect him from... Bob. Yeah, protecting him, yeah. <laughs> it's actually his, his so name is spelt backwards. So, so yeah. despite, despite the abundance of organically grown food in his back, mm. back laneway mm. and mm. despite the aesthetic mm. beauty of mm. that laneway, mm. Bob didn't like the leaves. Yeah. Mm. Okay, how do you deal with Bob? How do you deal with Bobs in general um, <laughs> in yeah. life? In that, that, you kill him with kindness, don't you? That laneway project really helped me to well, taught me a lot about how to just be with that, accept it, um, just to keep the conversation going, to hear a person, and 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 understand that that's real for them, and so. Um, yeah, we we you know we did our best to 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 honor, to acknowledge and honor what people did and didn't want to see happen there. But then then it changes too. So people there were cha- along over the years that people would you know backflip and then or um, new people have moved to the area and not like it too. And uh, so yeah, it was incredible. It's an incredibly interesting and challenging um, um, type of project. Um, but it, it and it's all about community development and. And what we found was that most of our time we're in conversation with people and, and Lance would always be saying, Dan, work and, work and talk, work and talk, you know, like because you know, like, like, we'd be down there on Friday Arvos and getting stuff done and I'd someone would come along and want to, you know, talk about and, something. And you'd give them time. Yeah, yeah, and Lance would be like, you know, like, come, like. Lance, Lance is goal-driven. Yeah, get stuff done. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, but I see what you mean. Like y- you do have to just accept other people's point of view. I mm. mean, because it's like it's the same with you. Like, you know, like y- you can't just think that a garden is the best thing for everyone mm. either. Like you have to accept mm. that, don't you? Yeah. And, and you don't want to, I guess you don't want to polarise people either. Mm. Is that, are you conscious of that? Um, Not really. I'm not sure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Like, mm. um, I'm just really, I'm just really inspired. I want to go back to the 
uh, living classroom project. So you sort of touched on a bit. Can you just explain exactly what it is? Mm. Like what 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 was it what was it doing? I mean, again, I asked you this question. I, I know I already know what it is, mm. but can you tell everyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, go. Uh, <laughs> hang on, just I'll get the definition out. I've got it written down in somewhere. Have you, did you, have you got that in your notes? Uh, <laughs> I don't take notes. Yeah. I don't write notes. Um, I don't write questions. <laughs> Sometimes go. Well, uh, no, I do. Write what questions. is it? Uh, it's a program for young, uh, for for primary school children. Uh, we target year three kids, and we 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 um it's 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 a a program where children choose to do it, and they they choose to become an amb- ambassador. They become part of a team, and that team ha- is on a mission. Has a mission to to establish a productive. Um, permaculture garden in their school grounds that will function as an outdoor classroom that teachers can bring the rest of the school out into to learn um their to 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 throw by learn by engaging in the garden they're they're learning key learning areas and covering their their curriculum um they're, they're meeting their curriculum outcomes that they might be doing in the classroom so it's kind of yeah, it's project based. Yeah, twenty first century learning skills and mm. all that, all that stuff. I almost said all that shit, but no, it's good stuff. It's yeah. good learning. Yeah. So it's a, it's a hands on approach. Yeah. With the underlying theme of sustainability and sustainable practices. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So they're it's magic. Yeah. How many how many schools do you think you've developed? Oh. Say you've you develop a permaculture space within the school, and then the kids, you know, maintain it and mm. learn in that and. Yeah, so, so how many how many schools do you think you and Aaron have developed together? Mm. Um, it's in in Wollongong, the Illawarra. Oh, I don't know. It's probably I'd be guessing. Hey, I, I'm. It's it maybe twenty five schools in Wollongong in the Illawarra that have started the program. Um, and then of those who are still going, there, there wouldn't be 25 currently running the exact program. They kind of morph, but we're, we're yeah, there's, um, a, you know, I haven't, I haven't added them up, you know, um, but for a small, for a regional, for a regional town, that's, it's quite a, it would have to be the uh, largest concentration of of um, schools that are doing a permaculture-based um, program in the country, I'd, I reckon, uh, in that's happening in the Illawarra, Wollongong, and southern suburbs of Wollongong, and uh, in, and and wider Illawarra. Get, get them early. Get them early. Mm. That's what you're doing. Yeah. So you're an activist. You're a gnarly <laughs> activist. Covert. Oh, Get to the kids. It. No, it's true though. Yeah. You're changing cultures. Mm. Can you like describe those spaces that you're developing? Like what are the key elements that are in them? The centre of the garden or the heart of the garden is a seating circle where we, we, we're we taking some of the ties that you're using uh, away from your, your, your Indo sandals. Oh, they're not Indo- mine. They're not mine. That's Indo Soul. <laughs> Indo Soul. Yeah. Use code THT <laughs> at checkout. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, no. Yeah. So those ties. Similar concepts. Yeah, like show you. up in the school um, mm. garden as, a, as the foundations for a seating circle. That becomes the the hub for where we bring the team together, the students together, to to start the day. So there's a, a heart of the garden where all the where the gardens are, uh, at the cent- at the heart of the garden is a seating circle. Then well, why do you always put a seating circle in the heart of the garden? In so it's made from tires, yes, with wood slats on top. Yeah, yeah so we okay. pair the tires up. Low, low profile tires are the ones to go yeah. with. Yeah, they've got a very narrow wall on them, so they really they're, about, they're yeah. rigid and they feel they they're very rigid and and sturdy for holding the bearers. So they're too high. They're set up in the in off a radial point, so the perfect circle, six meters in diameter. And then we have yeah you know, bearers, and then really beautifully radial cut timber to form a very geometric uh, timber top. Amazing. that's um, really beautiful to look at, and it so that the tires don't diminish that. It actually works really well together. And and then what we've found is that 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 seating circle, this inanimate object, becomes like a teacher's aid because it helps the person who's facilitating twenty or twenty five kids. In the garden to 
to get settled and to to get into a team and to take turns at talking to to listen when someone else is talking so it helps to set the culture of what the groups how the groups going to work together how they're going to behave how to have a conversation and how to get started and a, ba- a place to come back to and then it also becomes the hub when the ambassadors these team that we're working with will then bring a class out so if we've got a, a team of tr- really, you might have yeah, your ambassadors, 12 or 15 or 18 ambassadors who then can t- help team teach with uh, a group of, a whole class that comes out that may not have been in the garden at all or very much and then lead that, that bunch of kids out into activities in an organised way. So we're role modelling um, how to organise that group with our ambassadors and then they'll step into leadership roles and then role model to the, the class that comes out. So they're, they're getting practice, they're getting trained to, to be able to uh, manage it and teach other kids. So it's a t- kids teaching kids. Kids is the ultimate goal. When you get that happening, then the program is, is meeting all of the, if it's, it's, um, yeah, the, the objectives of, um, yeah, when kids are starting to engage other kids. And, and owning it. And owning it, yeah. Mm. <sighs> So good. Like every time I hear that, I'm just like, yes, that's what it should be. That's what education should mm. be. Um, so you actually walk them through the from the initial phases so we, of assessing the area, designing the area on paper, drafting it, etc. In a high school, we engage the students in the planning and design directly. So we might we do a five day. Um, workshop with with the students, and they work in, in teams of three. And go through a site, uh, uh, go through the planning and design process, come up with their concepts in response to the brief that they help develop and the school develops and that we give them what our needs are. And then, yeah, we merge all of the, the student work into one final concept and then we'll engage them in the build. In a primary school, we, we, we don't do that de- depth of engagement in the design. Um, it's more with the... Try and we 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 um, create the the blank canvas for them, or all of the elements are there, and the children come and colour it all in with all the gardens. Mm. Garden, they learn all the practices, build the soils, grow the food, establish the food forests, establish the biodiversity areas, set up the com, develop, um, you get the the engine room of the composting. Uh, the compost engine room fired up and they do it all, you know, so but we have to, we might be working with, yeah, little people in year three and um, initially and so, and it might be quite a big garden with many, you know, well, stacked up with vegetable beds. and uh, Yeah, so what and, is, yeah, some, give me some more elements like veggie yeah. beds, like no-dig gardens. Yeah, we refer more to those now as worm lasagnas. So the no-dig oh, really? is kind of so like... Is uh, that term, okay. So, yeah, we, uh, it's... It just, yeah, you've got to get up. It's 2021, Shannon. So, yeah, we've, yeah, you've, this version, that you version that you're running with is a bit outdated. <laughs> when did you do your course? Yeah, we, we were quite like, we so when we. have to update the course. Well, you know, when we teach the big kids on the PDC, it's the language. But you call it with the, the students. It's worm lasagna, it's, yeah. Or is it because it's more engaging? Well, it's more actually what it is. We're, cr- we're not doing so much digging when we're doing a no dig anyway. It's, I mean, we do a little bit of digging, sorry, yeah. when, we, when we're doing our no dig thing, but it's more aerating and it's actually much like a big lasagna of organic matter and compost and worm castings. and. and well, effectively um, you're making like a super compost mound. Yeah, that then you grow out of, you grow veggies out of. Yeah, we're putting a like a layer of a of a compost heap. Or it's not quite because instead of using raw organic raw manures, we're using finished compost. That'd be the only difference. Okay. So we're doing this laying of green, greens and browns. So carbon like straw and green like comfrey or lucerne or um, different chop and drop type plants and. Um, yeah, so we lay layers of green and brown and compost and rock dusts and we use our magic potion, which is this water mix that in for an adult we would say it's a magic potion but and to children too, we're, we're mimicking a flooding event. So we, we're really jazzing up the water and doing these la- layers of organic matter that are breaking down on top of the soil, not in it, 
and building the, and then very quickly being colonised by um, microbial life, my, bacteria and fungal activity and worms and other uh, decomposers, all the, well, the, the arthropods, things that chew and chew things up, little beetles and grubs and that. So the whole thing over a season of three months converts, breaks down and um, into decomposing organic matter and becomes part of the soil structure, mm. gets taken down into the soil um, by, by soil life and at the same time is producing food. And by doing that twice a year, these children become expert soil builders. So you, you, you do another worm lasagna on top of another worm lasagna? Yeah. You but do that twice a year? And then, yeah. So if I'm correct in saying this, you, if you do that for years on end, yes. you are effectively healing the soil and healing the land. Yes, because we're from a soil um, structure perspective, we're... Soil is four parts. It's soil organic. It's soil air, soil water, soil minerals, and soil organic matter. So we're working with all of those. When we aerate the soil with a fork, we're we're increasing the the air, aerobic um, capacity. We're, we're we're bringing air back into the soil initially. We're, we're increasing. We're reducing compaction so that air and water can get back into that bed that might have compacted a little bit over the that season. We're then um, remineralizing and then returning decomposed organic matter in the form of proper compost, and we're boosting it by doing the lasagna of extra layers of straw and and greens. And so the whole thing is is, is the, that that method of soil building is what is um, addressing the four constituents of soil: soil, air, soil, water, soil minerals, and soil organic matter. And so it's a if for someone who wants to get into soil, soil, the soil science, they can really explore all that. But, or you can just enjoy the practice and of doing something that's truly healing for the ground and restorative for the soil health, and that's reflected in the crops that are harvested um, at the end of throughout, you know, through, uh, through the summer and all, summer, spring and summer season, or the autumn and winter season. So. Yeah, the met- from year year like it's a spiritual practice. Uh, f- yeah, I think that um, people may some people may come to that point where they feel that the the seasonality uh, of of the 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 gardening and the the um, the evolution, the growth of the garden, the the re- the response, how the garden responds to. The physical improvements that are being created by the the gardening practices, there, there's an energy or vibrancy to that space that can is palpable when you walk in it. It, it you can see it in the in the the health and vitality of the produce, and you can you can hear it in the conversations of people that are coming into the garden. The words that are people are choosing or or um, expressing in, is there, in their response to being there in a space that is beautiful, it's abundant, it's biodiverse and it's inclusive and it's, it's got amenity and um, it's a, a lovely place to be in and so it touches that part of us that is more than just the rational worldview or the material worldview and we can see direct examples of how life cycles are happening before our eyes and maybe reflect on our own life cycle and the um, the, um, the the impermanence of everything, into, but then also the permanence there too because, yes, um, life is coming and going in short life cycles but it's returning also. Like a compost heap is a great example of where nothing goes away. It, it just keeps cycling and coming back in new versions of itself. So um, a pile of weeds gets turned into a beautiful zucchini. It's not hard to for a person, a young person, to see that happens. There's a transformation from one form to another, and so we're seeing the minerals bound up in the zuc- in the weeds, and now um, have gone through a transformation process. They're still there; they're just new versions of themselves. They're now compost. That compost is going into the soil and now it's gone. We can't see it anymore, but it's, it's become the plant leaf and stem and roots and the flowers and the fruit. So it's, you know, there is a depth to, 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 um, a depth to the, the worldview that is greater than just the, the material and the physical process of 
having a garden and growing food, we can see and feel a connection to it, something greater. Oh, Dan, that's so good, man. <laughs> it's just great, dude. It's so good. And like um, what like sort of what changes do you see in children when, when they're in that space? Do you, see, do you notice a difference in their behaviour or their demeanour? Definitely, yeah. When we first started with a new school and a program um, – is happening and has been happening for, you know, only a few months, even weeks, you know, we get feedback directly from the observing the behaviour of the new children that we've met and you can see the, 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 how they're presenting, um, how they're behaving, how they're relating to one another, how they're, how they're relating to the f- person or the teacher who's facilitating. And, the, yeah, you can see the changes, you see the enjoyment, see the the um the growth or the um the the feedback about how they how they find being in it but either verbally or just their physical activity and how they're relating to other kids and also feedback from teachers in the classroom about how a student might be um improving in their behavior in the classroom based on how the benefits of being out in the garden once nice. a, once a week or a fortnight so cool. Yeah. Definitely some, there's kids who, who might be struggling in class and they become really great leaders in the garden and they find a place to, 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 to uh, just to, to, to do really well and, and, um, and whereas they might Cause find Because they're, they're outside. Mm. You know, like, I mean, let's face it, and I was one of those kids, like, I just hated being inside. Mm. You know, um, I just wanted to get out. I just felt trapped. Mm. So yeah, it's a start. Yeah, so definitely the the program is schools are, are, are doing the 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 project, the living classroom project, because it's helping with engagement of children back in 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 education. It's helping with behaviour, and it's helping. So yeah, they're, they're, that's a, that's a one of the the big one of the real benefits that pe- the principals and teachers are seeing from having the program in their school. Yeah. Yeah, man. Plus not to like not to mention the the vast amount of learning opportunities that exist. Like mm. you can find maths, you can find yeah. science. I mean you can definitely find science. Mm. You know, you can find um the arts, mm. you know, like you can find culture in it like um, well, like all to- all types of well being, you can find he- health and PE mm. in it. So yeah, like it can really be so cross curricular that it's um, it's such a benefit. Mm. Um, I guess from my experience, uh, like I think the younger kids are easier to get a buy in with because mm. they're more like they're more en- enchanted by the big idea of growing food. Mm. I have found it challenging with teenagers to get the same buy-in. I find you either get ones that are all in or just nothing at all. They just just hate it because it's too much work and it's mm. dirty and they're missing that whole concept of it. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah I think the high school is a totally different model to what would be happening in primary schools, but the space is still the same. Like what we found in the high schools, that we the, the patterning of the landscape and the – the elements like seeding circles and the, the earthworks that gets create the the type of earthworks to um, manage surface water runoff and catch and store that water in in swales or ditches on, and create mounds. So that the patterning of of the land is and the garden is very similar to the primary school. So there'll be food forests and food gardens and and um, all, all of those things I've, I've mentioned before, but the engagement of the older young, so young people at high school is different, and and definitely that's where the expertise of, and and you know really inspiring teachers and mm. that that ha, that um are, are really that's fundamental then to be able to make it work in a high school and get creative about linking um, projects in the garden to the to their their curriculum. And it's 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 true. Like and one thing I have noticed with teenagers, even even if they don't want to do the work and they don't want to get dirty, every time they still, even the biggest haters, just I, I they they love being in the space. Mm. They just they still love being there. They don't want to do anything. Yeah. But they just love being in the space. And that was the the 
biggest takeaway I got from working at the green school for, for a while there was it was just for the children, it was just a really nice place to be every mm. day, regardless of the quality of education they were getting in the classroom. Just being in that environment, surrounded by an abundance of greenery and mm. abundance of plants and trees and a distinct lack of metal and concrete, so it's all bamboo and um, and thatched roofing and, and, and all that stuff. It was, yeah, it was, it's just a very calming presence and it was just a, a nice place to be even as a teacher. Like even if I was having the worst day, I wasn't. I was like, I'd enjoy walking in the gates and being in that environment. And I just like, ah, oh. yeah. So anyway, yeah, just and, that, share that. I, and I think that's a really great um, reason to just, that's, that alone is a good enough reason to, to, to have the, to develop a gar- the gardens, the grounds around the school. Create a beautiful space. Built environment. Yeah, create a beautiful space because that does make a difference to a student and a teacher's ex- day, day-to-day experience. And the that, humans in yeah, general. yeah. And a lot of schools that we, you know, to link it back to what we we're talking about before, are, in, are very have very um, large areas of the land covered with bricks and uh, with concrete and bitumen hard surfaces and and quite large um, b- buildings. Yeah, that they aren't soft; they're hard buildings. They're not the luxury of the green school with bamboo and thatched roofs. It's bricks and steel and glass and concrete. And so, yeah, just just doing a garden is going to help. A student to have a better day at school and the teachers too, yeah. if they've got a beautiful space to go out to for a bit of respite uh, during their breaks. Yeah, it's like, like where do you want to spend the days of your childhood or your young years? Like, because mm. those memories are so profound. Mm. Like, you're absorbing so much as a young person, mm. and um, they have such a those, that period of a child's life has, has such a big impact on their adulthood. What happens to them and. Um, yeah, so why would you put them in a brick room mm. with like synthetic carpet? I don't know. Like it doesn't make sense to me. Mm. But anyway, it's a reality. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can covertly beautify things, right? Yeah. Yeah. We can. Listen, but- man. I'll go, <laughs> go. Listen, I've got a, I've got a question for you. So like what's next for you? What's next? Like I know you still – you work – you know, the work you do with elemental permaculture, running permaculture design courses, living classroom projects like the amazing one you've just completed and you've, you've just finished a few days ago, which the photos look amazing. Like what's, what's next for you in the big scale of your life? Like what do you want to achieve next? You've achieved a lot, but what do you think you'd want to achieve? Well, um, work-wise, I'm, I'm really enjoying um, – doing something different that I'm doing is illustration and starting to create a a body of work of of drawings that capture very yeah drawings that capture the practices that we do um illustr and illust in illustrations of that and putting together an illustrated guide so that's very accessible for for anyone you know doesn't have a lot have that wouldn't have, so I'd, I'd, my dream is to to be able to pull all it all together and have this beautiful illustrated guide to permaculture and and um, that we that would that would inspire and enable a person to go out and do stuff in the garden that we're talking about and and so yeah I'm I'm, in, I'm that's something I'm I'm one I'm working on I, I am um, always interested in how to make. Um, education more engaging and more fun and more interesting and 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 for for, for a few years now I've been banging on about the importance of um, moving well while we garden. I've yeah. I've been a casualty myself of well, of not moving very back. well. Yeah, you know, ra- razzed my back and <laughs> um, you know like yeah from not moving well. But for, so that. So, and it's, I've noticed that a lot of people who garden or who are working in environmental restoration, they they don't take good care of their bodies in the process of doing that work. And so I, I, had, I was forced to take a look at how I was lifting and moving and repetitive strain injuries. And I, I, and I, and I started noticing um, how, how common that is for gardeners. And so I'm really interested in 
again, from an illustrator, as an illust- not that I'm an, I am an illustrator, but well, you, wanting to you are. move to trying to develop um, illustrations that capture that information and support people to... With to, less words. Yeah, So yeah. you want to say more in pictures, more in, in illustrations than you do in written words. Yeah, and, and yeah, so that, that's part of, I guess, I think the part of what I'm interested in is for my own self too, but also as an educator and a trainer and a person engaging people in, in, in permaculture is, yeah, really focusing on wellness there, not just, yeah, so this, the, the idea that wellness, what is it to guard, what does it mean to garden well? And one thing is, yeah, we want really good, beautiful, healthy soils and healthy produce, but it's also about our wellness too and wellness. So how to garden well is to move well, it's to think well, it's to feel well, it's to relate well, it's to, it's to, um, it's to, in addition to all of the good gardening practices, yeah. So that that I'm I I feel yeah, you know, inspired around that. Uh, I want to travel more. I want to surf more. I want to get better at surfing. <laughs> I've been out of the water for so many years, and I've just got back in and and um, getting back into the water over the last six months and loving it. So um, yeah, and I always come back to tree planting. Um, I feel like I'm going back to that more and more that the real like gardens are so short cycled vegetable gardens are so short cycled and mm. that's that's the way they are and so I want to make I want to really be doing more tree planting in 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 and around my home and community and and be part of that movement as a strategy to uh, yeah, combat some of the cha- you know regional and global to, challenges of to combat urban heat um that um, what do you call it? urban heat? The heat island, and, urban heat islands. Yeah, so shade yeah. corridors for people and cars, and more biodiversity in the backyards and streets and suburbs. And dude, yeah. I remember when you gave us a uh, a tour around Tom Thumb Lagoon, mm. and there was a fig tree. I think it was a Morton Bay fig. Ah, uh, they or was it Morton Bay? There was a, f- a different. There was Morton Bay. There was some Port Jackson figs, yeah, small okay. leaf figs, yeah, yeah. And I remember we you went out oh, like there's this beautiful fig tree. And I mean, it was it was big, like mm. it was over twenty years old. Mm. But I mean, it, it just looked massive. And then you went, you know, I, I planted that, and I was like, like no way, dude. <laughs> like that looks like so majestic and huge. Like I mean, that must be so. Without sounding too, I don't know, like much like a tree hugging hippie, like it must be really nourishing for the soul. Mm. Mm. And is that is that another reason why you want to continue to plant trees to to keep to get that feeling and share that feeling with others? Well, I moved out of the area to Queensland. Yeah, in properly, I, I bailed out in two thousand and fourteen. Seven years have passed, and I haven't planted a tree. In this place where I'm living now, and I've, I've more and more, in, in, I've started to realise that planting trees where we live is a is a way of connecting to that place. So when I go back to there where that fig tree is that you're referring to, I feel a connection to that place, like really strong because the tree's there, you know, and and it's and it's looking after it's it's this tree is growing. And providing so many benefits, most people would know all of the the range of you know so many benefits that trees provide. And so I realised, wow, I haven't planted any tre- by not planting any trees in this current place where I'm living. I I don't have that connection to that place like I do um, in t- Tom Thumb or the yeah, Laneway and yeah. parts of Port Kembla and the schools. Like so you that's put your roots down. Yeah. So that for me is what I feel is part of creating connection and sense of belonging to a place. When we start planting trees there, we, then so, we start to send those roots down and, and truly connect to that place. And so, yeah, I, I, that's been my, Every whenever we do a PDC, we write a letter to ourselves at the end or during the court at the beginning, actually, and then we send that to, back to the students and ourselves uh, the following year. So you receive your letter. You I, didn't get, I didn't get mine. 
Yeah, maybe. I probably did. I probably didn't check my mail. Did you email it? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. No, I probably got it. Yeah. I probably got it. <laughs> Jake, sorry, dude. Uh, <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, so... I think I yeah no nah, I'm not sure. No, but I love what, I love what you just said about like it prov- it gives you a sense of belonging mm. to that area. Yeah, you know? I, I had that recently when I was at, at at that project that you and I worked on at that school, mm. um, and I hadn't been there for two years, you know, and even like just looking at uh, and granted it had been left overgrown a little bit. Uh, I wasn't maintained very well I, 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 because of COVID as well. The, you know, schools were shut down, and but it still thrived as a good permaculture garden should. But even seeing some of the pioneer plants mm. and the acacias, and how much they developed, and the bamboo that we planted, I mean, yeah. fuck, like I was like, no way, yeah, you know. And this was planted. I mean, we were planting into landfill, mm. you know, and it's just like, no way, dude, yeah. Yeah, so it feels good yes. on a smaller scale than what you've experienced. But even yeah, and that that's that. They endure, the trees will endure, an annual garden might have its, it has its season and then it might go into, not neglect, but it, it, it may just sit there for years, but the trees keep growing. and the trees keep growing. And, and so we, if, yeah. we can, if we can, for me anyway, I feel that that's really a high priority for me is to get out there and plant trees and, and do it on public land so that I can get So you back. don't have to ask permission. No, that's how, right. How do you, you know? How do you know it's not public though? <laughs> um, oh, what median strips? Yeah, you know, like can you can you just go and plant shit on a median strip? Well, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm not advocating planting trees where cars are going. Advocate, like to <laughs> advocate. <laughs> um, the <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, I'm deliriously yeah, tired. Yeah, by the way, yeah. keep going. Um, yeah, go out and plant trees and just, yeah, keep the forgiveness card in your pocket. And, Dude, yeah, Aaron, yeah. that's the wisest yeah, thing he's ever yeah. said to me. Just mm. ask for forgiveness yeah. later. <laughs> yeah. It will be right. No. <laughs> I mean, in that concept, planting, planting plants is yeah. pretty innocent. Yeah, public land, do it and connect with people. Yeah, yeah and do process. it respectfully mm. and, and mindfully, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, don't, be, don't be militant about it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, start with one, get a, get a conversation going. Someone will come along and ask why you're doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell them. Yeah. Well, listen, man, dude, it's been epic. It's been almost two hours. Wow. Um, and, yeah, like I'll say it again, like it's such a pleasure. I mean, um, again, the fact that we met up tonight was just um, quite random. And, mm. um, yeah, like I really do believe that, the right guests arrive on this podcast when the time is right. And uh, I'd actually wanted to speak to you for some time. And I was, was always wondering how can I tie this guy down? And um, it's the voice of people like you that I really want to hear out there more. But the ironic thing about people like you, you don't really go seeking opportunities to put your voice out there. But I really think that they're the voices we need. Mm. Now, like I said, I said to and I said, you probably don't even have a social media account. You're yeah. like, oh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm super grateful for your time. Yeah. So um, I ask all guests to come to the podcast with a cause they want to support or advocate for. So what would you like yeah. to support or advocate for? Well, we're trying to get the – we're getting the living classroom off the ground up in southeast Queensland and now we started – we're working with a little school, Monkland State School there and – there, um, we've we we it's a perennial challenge to to um yeah to to um to get the to build a little budget each year for that for that project. So we 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 yeah living if you get the living classroom project is something that I'd yeah encourage people to look up. There's a website you can check out, and there's lots of great um stuff on YouTube, little videos and. Stories from students around um, the schools that we're working with, yeah. So that'd be a cool project. Just check it out and look in, look it up. That would, if you could do that and share it, really, just share what we're doing with your with your friends. Um, and if you need any information, we, we to to um, to help a person or a teacher at your school to find out more. Yeah. Awesome, man. And I'll put a link to that in Dan's show notes, um, along with links to Elemental Permaculture and. 
Um, you can find those links um, on the Terrible Happy Talks website um, and there's also links to other places that you can listen to this podcast uh, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, uh, Buzzsprout, Stitcher, iHeartRadio and um, if you could subscribe and leave a review on any of those platforms, it would really help the show but if you don't, that's cool too. I'm just so grateful that you're listening and uh, you're definitely worth the effort. So listen, my brother. I've got a gift for you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, our friends at Indosol. Actually, I've got two gifts. Our friends at Indosol will be sending you a pair of flip-flops or slides made from repurposed motor vehicle tires. And, um, yeah, they, they hook up everyone that's on the show. Wow, so awesome. thanks for being on. I'll have to yeah. get your shoe size. Yeah. And thanks mm-hmm. to the guys at Indosol. And if you do, get on to Indosol.com, use code THT at checkout for a discount and yeah, support the show and support an amazing company. Now, the second present, Daniel, is you get <laughs> the sustainably manufactured THT Circle logo sticker. Wow. But it's not sustainably manufactured, <laughs> I don't think. But um, I love stickers and I only give these to people who have been on the show. So now there's only 97 wow. of them in circulation, I think. 97 or 96? No, 96. Your episode 96. Wow. Oh, no, not your episode 97. Wow. How cool. <laughs> Pretty happy to be in this club. Thanks, Dude, Steve Shannon. Thank you, man. I'm stoked. <laughs> Is there anything you want to end on? Anything oh. profound? I mean, you've said oh. two hours of profound, profound stuff. Oh, look, the importance of um, connecting, staying in connection with good friends. Yes, yeah. brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet, dude. I love you, man. 